All right, as we go through this, I'm basically going to be talking about seed starting in the home garden production. We're not going to be looking at it from a commercial standpoint, but I want to talk about what do the what does the general public experience when they're trying to start their tomato, peppers, eggplant seeds in their home. So we're going to be looking at some of the pros and some of the cons of actually doing some of these seeds from home. And then I'm going to go through some lists of some of the things that need to be transplanted and some of them that does not need to be transplanted at all, but needs to be directly sown by seeds into the garden. So as we go through this, I, I, want, you, I want to highlight the newer website called uthort.com. Now, when you go to uthort.com, I can't say enough good things about it. This is the, the new horticulture website for the University of Tennessee. When you click on educational resources, there's a bunch of different tabs that will open up, and you'll see, you'll see things like, vegetables, fruits, lawns, trees, ornamentals, whatever you're interested in that's mostly geared toward growing things in Tennessee. So when you click on educational resources, you can find a lot of growing standards that are, that are used in Tennessee. Or if you can't find what you're looking for, just go to the search bar at the top where it says search this website and then type in tomato, potato, whatever you're looking for. But I wanted to highlight this website again. And I know I talk about it every time, but it's a really good website and new stuff's coming on this website every week. Looking at the seeds, we have people who, whenever I say, well, why don't you start your own seeds at your house? Because it's, it's cheaper to start your own tomato seeds at your house. These are the responses that people always say back. Why always fail and they never grow? So we're gonna be looking at some of the reasons why they may not be growing, and we're gonna be looking at some of the reasons why they may fail to begin with. Now, not all seedlings are gonna grow perfectly for you. Not all gardeners keep everything alive. Now, I'm sure there's some gardeners on here that's gotten pretty close to keeping everything alive. I am not one of those gardeners. I have killed plenty of plants, and I think the only way we learn is by experimenting with some of these plants. If you've never grown tomatoes from seeds, I think you need to at least try once or twice because it's not as easy sometimes as people think. Kind of getting to the, the basic first steps, we need to look about when we need to transplant our plants into the garden. Now, I remember seeing places selling tomato plants a month and a half ago in February, and I was thinking, this is a terrible time to plant tomatoes in the garden, but you had nurseries, garden centers, box stores already bringing in some warm season vegetables that should not be planted outside at all. So those people had to kind of keep those tomatoes or peppers for six or eight more weeks to actually get a, a good time to plant those into the garden. What you need to do is you need to determine when you're going to plant your vegetables in the garden that you're going to grow the transplants for. So it's going to be different. Cool season vegetables need to be planted in the garden about March the 15th. Warm season vegetables, they need to be planted in the garden about April the 15th. And I'm gonna go through a little bit more specifics of some of those in just a second. We also need to buy seeds. If you've not already bought some of your warm season vegetable seeds, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, I suggest you go ahead and do that right now because those things can still be started inside right now. And when I get to kind of showing you some dates, I don't want you to think, well, I've run out of time. No, you still have time. And if you can still find some seeds, go ahead and, and get those if you can, because seeds can last quite a few, quite a few years in the refrigerator, the freezer, and if they're stored in a drier area without being in the sun, they're gonna do fine anyways. And they'll last for years. Make sure you buy the containers, Make sure you buy a good quality medium, I and mean, then I'll explain what I think is a good quality medium, and anything else that you may need to start these. Now, sometimes additional lighting will help out, and I'll go through that in just a second. Now, growing seeds, growing plants from seeds is really simple, and I think it's fun. And I think if you're trying to encourage kids to garden, it's one way to actually kind of get them hooked into gardening to begin with. So I wanted to show you, most of you probably won't even guess what this is. But I had some kids in high school who uh, we, we grew a bunch of seeds in our greenhouse classes when I taught high school. And these were elephant ear seed pods that we got from a friend. And we were able to grow hundreds of elephant ears from seeds. And I think a lot of you probably didn't realize you can grow elephant ears from seeds. But these were the Thailand giant 
elephant ears. And, and it was really simple. And you can kind of see that the kids didn't space them properly in those cell packs right there. All right. Why? We grow things from seeds because we want to grow the variety that, that we really like. Now, sometimes the varieties that I really like on tomatoes or peppers, I cannot find at the store. But I go and buy the seeds and then I grow whatever I want because I can't find the plants in the store. Because we see typically the same general consensus of, of tomato varieties, the same general consensus of pepper varieties in the store. We don't see some of the more obscure varieties that, that I like sometimes and some of the other ones that you may like. And you can grow exactly how many you need. If you're only needing, you know, 25 tomatoes, buy a pack of tomato seeds that are, you know, 30 or 35 because you're going to have some not grow to begin with. But if you need 200, you know, chef's choice orange tomatoes and you can't find those in the store, grow how many that you want. You may not be able to find that many at the store. And also determine the right planting date for you. When we see these plants for sale in the store sometimes, it's not the ideal time to be planting these. So like I mentioned, I saw tomatoes. I saw people pushing tomato plants a month and a half ago in the last week of February. And I, I couldn't imagine trying to keep a tomato for six more weeks before I actually planted it into my garden. Everything grows from seeds. These are oak leaf hydrangeas in this picture right here. And then we grew some different varied seeds of uh, one called Little Honey. And some of the seedlings came out completely yellow. And it was really kind of exciting for us to, to grow oak leaf hydrangeas from seeds. Test the germination on your seeds. Now, if you're like me, you're a seed hoarder and you've got seeds that you've just collected over the years, or maybe you've planted some in a pack and you've just kind of rolled up the pack and threw it in a cupboard somewhere. Those seeds more than likely are still good. If you want to test out those seeds, pull out 20, put them in a wet paper towel, and then put them in a Ziploc bag in a kind of a warmer area. See if they actually grow. You can test your germination by putting 20 seeds in there and then just get a good germination rate on these. Now that picture right there is some old peas that my grandfather had. And I got this, these lady peas from my uncle this past summer. And my grandfather put them in the little medicine jar in 1987. And I'm sure these seeds are still good. I plan on trying to plant some of these this year. So you can kind of see 1987, those peas are uh, going on 30 years old. So that's pretty crazy. 33 years old. When we were talking about the differences between planting on cool season versus warm season, it needs to be anywhere from six to eight weeks before you want to plant it into your garden. So ideally, if I'm going to plant broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, and I'm going to do it from transplants, which ideally those, if, it, if it's in a cool season vegetable family and it forms a head, it needs to be transplanted into the garden. If it's a leafy green, it can be directly sown by seeds into the garden. But if I wanted to start my broccoli seeds inside my house before I actually take them outside, I'm going to plant my broccoli about March the 15th outside. I want to go back six to eight weeks. So looking at it, it could be the last week of January, the first week of February is when I need to start transplanting broccoli seeds inside my house because to get a nice transplantable size anywhere from three, four, five inches tall, they need to be planted six or eight weeks before you actually move them outside. Now, that's going to be varied. Now, if your house is warmer, if your soil has some fertilizer in it, um, if you have a lot of light on them, now that's going to be varied. So I don't want you to say, well, Lucas told me six weeks and it took, you know, four weeks. That's going to be varied based upon how you actually grow them. But a good general consistency anyway from six to eight weeks to, to get a transplantable size. Now, warm season vegetables, Ideally, you can still start them right now, even though it's the last week of March, but we need to start them about the third week of March. So March the 15th, because we need to have these outside after the danger of frost. Now, most of you probably know when the danger of frost is. The, the window of frost, when we ideally can have our last frost, is April the 15th. Now, that is not always correct. Two years ago, we had a light frost on April the 17th. And people had a lot of their warm season vegetables out. I would encourage you to watch the weather. 
because the weathermen are always correct in their assumptions, right? <laughs> Thought that would bring a few laughs. So looking at some of the things that are generally directly sewn into the garden, even though you can buy transplants for these. Now, I have seen transplants for beans, zinnias, corn, okra, cucurbits, the squash worm. I've seen transplants for all of these. Some of them just do better directly sown into the ground. Um, I think they just get a better foothold into the ground that they already have as opposed to being started somewhere and moved because when we look at it, some vine crops have sensitive roots. So it would be things in the squash family, things that have long running vines, watermelons, cantaloupes, cucumbers, they also can get stem injury. So if you buy a four pack of watermelon and they're really long already running and you slowly move them, you take them to your truck, you take them out, you transplant them, you can bend that little stem at the base of the ground and damage the whole plant and some of your money's already wasted down the drain. And that's why I think on some of them, when they get so big in these cell packs that we buy at the store, I think we need to directly transplant it into the garden by seeds as opposed to transplants but i've bought squash plants i bought watermelon plants i i've done it all but i think uh, they do better from seed so most of these vine crops just directly sell them to the garden and read the seed packet because some of them get really large when we're looking maybe i can move this around yeah I'm gonna move this down just a hair when we're looking at things i wanted to highlight a couple of charts so if you're trying to figure out what to grow in the garden from a transplant or directly from seeds, here's an easy chart that was found on the website uthort.com and it's under a vegetable gardening guide. And I'll show you that, that publication number in just a second. So if you've got questions and you're trying to figure out, well, should I start them from seeds? Should I start them from transplants? Like look at it. Uh, Peppers, typically from transplants. Tomatoes, you can't see it, but they're typically from transplants. Now, some things you can do both transplants and seeds, but I kind of wanted to, to highlight some things. On the far left, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, if it forms a head, ideally it needs to be transplanted into the garden. You don't typically take a bunch of cabbage, seed, cabbage seeds and broadcast them over your garden because they need to be spaced appropriately. Maybe I can bring that back up a little bit. Here's the publication number for that one uh, publication I was telling you where I showed you the charts of everything that was actually transplants or seeds. It's found under uthort.com. You can go to this series called Garden Planting, Plant Preparation, and Planting. It's under the Vegetable tab. And if you go to the UTK Publications website, you can also search for that W346-B. And it's a whole series of actually growing specific vegetables. So you'll find a whole guide on tomatoes. You'll find a whole guide on asparagus, a whole guide on potatoes. And all of these are geared toward Tennessee. So sometimes when you Google it, you're not actually finding Tennessee's recommendations. You could be finding Florida's or you could be finding somewhere up north like Maine, Michigan, Minnesota. And they don't always equate to Tennessee's growing seasons. Move that right there. Kind of showing you if we're directly planting some seeds into the garden, it's best if we can to put some some kind of sand with it because you can plant turnip greens too thick. And this is my turnip greens after about two and a half weeks. I planted them way too thick, and a lot of them actually choked each other out. And we got some damping off, and we had some actually die in patches. But if you're trying to plant greens like this and make a nice cover crop for the winter time, or maybe in the spring, you're planting some of these greens. If you're directly sowing some of these broadcast seeds, mix some sand with it just a little bit to help break up that sand or break up those seeds. When you're buying seeds, look for reliable sources and also look at the reviews online. Because if I just Google certain types of seeds, I can find some really crazy things online. Like if you someone was telling me that they found some really pink daffodils, and I, if I Google pink daffodils, yeah, I'm going to find pink daffodil seeds for sale on eBay. Typically, daffodils don't grow from seeds. And uh, I'm going to venture to say a lot of the photos that I saw while looking for pink daffodils were Photoshopped. So please review these online. Buy from a reputable seed company. There are tons of seed companies. 
And if you're interested, just look at the reviews online. There are a lot of good websites you can look for. I think Garden Watchdog is the main one that I look at if I'm looking for reviews for garden type companies and it's people saying the pros and cons of buying from certain websites and also you may not understand the differences between a hybrid versus an open pollinated if you keep seeds from a hybrid we'll say it was better boy tomato which is a hybrid and you had other tomatoes in the garden if you kept those seeds from the better boy theoretically it could have hybridized with another tomato and that tomato could or could not be better boy next year so if, and I like hybrids so a lot of them have really good disease resistance but I wanted to make that case if you're going to keep hybrid seeds sometimes you don't know exactly what you're going to get and you'll see some that are open pollinated and that usually kind of goes back to some of the the older type varieties this hard to do in the winter time don't overbuy seeds and I know when we're getting a ton of seed catalogs in January and February and we're looking outside and our garden is just a cold gray bucket of unhappiness and all we see in the forecast is rain and mud, we want to buy a lot of seeds. And I'm the same way. I buy way more than I ever need. But remember, you can keep those leftover seeds from next year and a refrigerator is an ideal place to keep these. I've got some seeds... <coughs> I've got some seeds that are a number of years old that are in uh, um, in, the, in my freezer also right now. And I, I think everything is going fine. I hadn't planted them in a couple of years, so we're going to see how they do. All right, kind of starting off with the basics of growing some of these seeds in the house. So I got off some of the things that we need to be doing right now. You still have time to plant some warm season vegetables. We need to start off with a good growing medium. And that will mean something that's not, you know, we hear the ad is cheap is not always great. Sometimes I see bags that'll say seeding mix, 99 cents, and it weighs 50 pounds for a really small bag. It's probably not the ideal best. We want a good mixture of peat moss, vermiculite, and perlite. Now, vermiculite is used to help hold moisture into the, the peat moss. Peat moss helps hold moisture and perlite helps it kind of drain out and adds that aeration to that soilless medium. When we're looking at some of these, we want a fine textured light medium. If you can, try not to find one with a lot of fertilizers because sometimes some of these younger seedling roots can burn. And I know we see some will say added fertilizer and sometimes I get a little scared about that, but we can see some of them just burn. But they should have a, I like it without fertilizer kind of going from there. You can, you can buy it with fertilizer. I'm not saying that's the wrong thing, but sometimes we'll see them overgrow too fast. And I want to help, I want to be able to control how fast they grow sometimes. Garden soil, regular dirt that we find outside in our yard is not recommended because it typically not the best, best mixture. We have an issue with compaction because sometimes when it dries out, it gets hard as a rock and it cracks. It's not a good medium for growing seeds. It could have diseases in it. It could have insect eggs that are over in winter in it, and it just dries out and becomes a brick. Good growing medium that we buy at the store has already been sterilized, so it should be free of all these pathogens from diseases, insects, bugs, and weed seeds. We don't think about that sometimes. Planting, when we're planting our seeds in cups, I'm gonna, I'll talk about some other things in just a second. I, I've got some in my, my daughter's nursery right now. They're in little bitty clear, clear cups that we're growing some daylily seeds in right now. I'm trying to teach my daughter how to grow seeds while she's four and a half weeks old. Lay the seeds across the top, lightly dust with soil. We need to keep these seeds moist. So I think one of the things, while, while we don't see some of them actually doing all that well, is they get too dry and they, they start dying while they're sending out their main roots. So I want to kind of make that point real clear. They need to stay moist, but not over water. They can rot if they're planted too deep. So if we have a really, really tiny seed and we plant it two inches too deep, it won't have enough energy to actually reach the surface to actually start growing and making photosynthesis for itself. So a lot of these really small seeds, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, broccoli, cauliflower, 
they really only need to be like a sixth of an inch, a fifth of an inch below any type of soil. They just need to be lightly dusted on top, just enough to keep the sun from drying them out. And I like to use vermiculite on top. Vermiculite is really good about keeping the moisture on top of these seeds. Avoid the windowsill. I have some seeds in my windowsill right now. So what does a plant do going toward light? It is going to grow towards light. So what's going to happen when we have tomatoes in a windowsill? They're going to start growing crooked. We move the container. They go back the other way, and they can get really tall and straggly really quickly. Ideally, they need to be started under lights inside somewhere of the house that we're actually that we're actually being able to control the light. So the light on one side, it's not actually growing toward the light. It's growing straight up. So we'll see systems that have light sitting over the top of them, and that's ideally what we need. And also the problem with the window seal is in the wintertime, late winter, the soil will get cold if it's right next to a window seal because some days it can be 80 degrees outside. Like last week, it was 80 degrees. Today, it's high of 50. That window sill is not the warmest part of the house. So for those temperatures to fluctuate from like 80 degrees to 50 degrees is a really shock in some of these seedlings. And I told you some of the light, if we have it in a window sill, can result in bent seedlings with taller stems. And also the, the temperatures can play a factor when determining whether some of these will actually grow or not. I like using vermiculite, and you can get a pretty cheap bag of vermiculite at most box stores. Um, local garden centers, nurseries will have smaller bags of, of vermiculite. So I will go through and dibble my holes in my, in my containers where I'm going to plant them, place my seeds on top, tomato, pepper, whatever, and then lightly dust it with vermiculite. I usually water my trays in before I put my seeds in them. I don't put my seeds in and then water because sometimes if I water it too hard, that seed will just get up and float over the top and float away. And I, and I didn't realize I lost the seed to begin with. <laughs> so I wanted to make that point clear. I dibble a little hole, I water it, and then I make sure I put my seed. Then I put my vermiculite on top. I think vermiculite really is, is great. And I, I keep a bag. I think I've got a bag in my truck toolbox right now. I, I use quite a bit of vermiculite when I'm starting seeds. Kind of highlighting some of the different seed mixtures you can find if you go to the store right now and you look for a seed, a good seed starting mix, you can find it 50 different brands. So whatever you think is will work for you. Now, some of you may have, have used some of these brands in the past. Now, I'm not advocating that one is better than the other, but just to kind of show you that we'll see tons and tons of different brand names out there. And it's just like anything else. Each company has their own brand of a seed starting mix. I like something that's light. I like something that's airy. I like something that has a mixture of vermiculite, peat, uh, and perlite. When we're looking at containers, you can buy these black containers to start these seeds in. You can find trays, like I've got a picture of right here. That's actually hydrangea seedlings again in that uh, tray. And you can buy a lot of these trays at your local stores, and they'll have black trays, and they'll have little bitty like cell packs, and we'll call them 1204s, which are 12 packs with four plants in a pack or we'll see something called a 606, which is six plants in a six pack. But you can buy them online, you can get whatever you want. But what's neat is we see a lot of, a lot of diversity in some of these seed starting things. So we'll see people using peat pots to start their seeds in and you can plant the whole pot over. And this is something I wished I would have thought about. Y'all may have not seen these yet, these poo pots, which are containers that are made from animal feces and you plant the whole container out to the garden. We see people starting things in milk jugs. It needs to have some kind of porous hole in it though so because you can rot seeds really quickly if there's no hole in the bottom of it. If someone's given you trays or if someone's given you pots, there are some diseases that can live on those for quite a few years. So we always encourage you to spray them down with a bleach mixture, a 10% bleach wash. I worked in a nursery for a few years during college, and every tray that we reused, he had a giant tub that he used. And he, had, he would put so many caps of bleach in it, and I had to kind of soak and clean all those trays before I was allowed to use them. We got to clean these trays. And transplanting is better at the seedling stage when you're moving it from something to, from a smaller tray into a bigger tray. 
we shouldn't be starting out tomatoes in a bigger pot. We should be starting out tomatoes in a smaller pot and then breaking those up and transplanting them. Ideally, I don't think you should start the tomato in the tray that you're going to transplant it from. I think they do better being transplanted one time before you plant them into the garden, just for kind of one of those transition stages. So we'll start the tomato seeds. After about three or four weeks, we'll move them to a, the container that they're going to be in for another two or three weeks, and then we'll move them into the garden. These seeds, these containers, whatever you've got, they must stay damp, and you can buy clear domes that go over the top, and damping off may occur. Now, damping off is where it's a fungal disease where we're keeping the seeds too wet, and there is a fine line between too much water and too less water. And I, I always try to err on the, on the side of caution of being too dry because I think I see more plants rotting from too much water than dying from too little water. So I wanted to kind of let you know, if you're trying to figure out if it's too wet or, or too dry, you can take your container, sharpen a pencil, and then stick it into the container into the soilless media where your seeds are. If it comes out wet, your soil is probably fine. If it comes out dry, your seed soil may need to have a little water to it, but just sharpen a pencil and stick it in there and see if it comes out wet or dry. If it comes out dripping, <laughs> you've got some bigger problems on hand. This is one of the neatest things that I see people starting seeds in now, and you can, these come in sandwiches. You can get a lot of these at a, a lot of restaurants, the to-go containers that's clear on top. You talk about a perfect little greenhouse container to start your seeds in. Poke some holes in the bottom, put your soilless media, your seed starting mix in there, poke a couple of holes in the top, and then make sure it's got some light over the top, and it's just like a perfect little greenhouse. I think the reason most seedlings fail is they get cold at certain times. Now, I mentioned warm season vegetables. You can still plant a lot of these right now, which are your tomatoes, eggplants, peppers. They like warm soil. I could theoretically plant tomatoes outside right now and then keep them covered. But if the soil's not warm enough, they're just going to sit there and not going to do well. So that's one of the issues. I think a lot of the plants that, that we, we see suffer in our homes, they're, they may be next to a window and they get cold. So you can buy these seedling mats and they kind of look like a, like a heat blanket, but they are developed to be able to stay wet. A heating blanket is not developed to stay wet, so you have to buy something that's developed for some type of a water. So these seedling mats work out great, and there's a lot of different brands. You can get heating cables that you can put around the pots, but these seedling mats keep it warm, and, you, and a lot of them have thermostats now, so you're able to see what temperature you're keeping them. Kind of looking at this, so this is a little seed bed my uncle started and he actually has sand in a little tray, that, in a little box that he built where he starts his seeds. And this was one of my favorite little tomatoes, Midnight Snack. So he put a heating cable all through that and he filled it full of sand. So the sand stays really warm. And we put our trays that we're starting our seeds on top. Supplemental light is typically needed. And you can find a lot of grow lights at a lot of places. The general rule of thumb is the light needs to be anywhere from four to eight inches from the plants. And I know that that seems crazy, but we're talking about this far from when the seeds have not started yet. Sometimes when it's up really too tall, it's not actually doing any good. These seedlings need their light really close to them just to actually get any good out of it. And if the light is too dim, they'll promptly tell you by stretching out and they'll start getting leggy. Well, Lucas, my, my seeds did not grow well. What happened? It could have been old seeds. So if you've got some seeds right now and you're going to be planting beans or corn or something that you directly sow into the garden this year, now's a great time to warm a paper towel, wet, wet a paper towel, put your seeds, 20 seeds in it, and put it in a Ziploc bag and see how they do well, see how they do. Your seeds may not be good anymore. Seeds does not emerge because the soil can be too wet or the soil can be dry. I shouldn't say soil, it's soilless media. So it's media, it can be too wet or too dry. There is a fine line that I mentioned. Sharpen a pencil, stick it down in there and see how wet it is. Also the problem is the temp can be too high or too low and seed can be planted too deeply. If it's seeds that we're transplanting out to the garden, so cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, some of those things that we're transplanting, 
they really need to be under the, the soil or their vermiculite no more than probably a quarter of an inch. That's really a lot though, just lightly dusted over the top, enough to keep the light off of them, but enough to kind of hold moisture on top of the seeds. Well, Lucas, I have really tall, straggly seedlings. The one thing I think about when someone says, I've got really tall, straggly seedlings, but I have a light that I'm putting on them, the light's not close enough. The light needs to be, like I said earlier, anywhere from four to eight inches away from the plants. The light intensity could be too low when it's up too high. Over fertilization, when these seedlings are really small, we probably should not be fertilizing them a whole lot to begin with. Now they'll tell you if they have a little bit of a yellow hue to them, that can be a little nitrogen. They could have a little purple hue to them, that can be a little phosphorus. If we fertilize them a whole lot, to, a whole lot to begin with, they're going to jump out of there really fast. We don't want them to jump out of there really fast. We want them to get their feet established first. We want them to develop healthy roots because that little seedling has a lot of energy in it. And once that plant actually gets up tall enough and it's starting to see the light four to eight inches away from it, it's starting to make its own light through photosynthesis. The temp can be too high at night. Most greenhouses we'll see. They need to actually have their temperatures lower at night because plants need a period of rest also. They don't need to be 80 degrees the entire time. Also, we get tall, straggly seedlings sometimes because the plants are just not spaced properly. We planted way too many seeds in such a tight spot. Another question that we get is when to transplant. Now a plant, whenever the seeds come out, the, the two seed leaves come out, you can see that first picture right here. The two leaves come out are called a cotyledon. Those are not the true leaves. Those will eventually fall off to make the new leaves. These were, excuse me, transplanted way too small. We only need to transplant these things when those cotyledons have kind of taken a back burner, they're kind of taking a back seat, and the new leaves are starting to come out of the top. When we see new true leaves, that's when we should transplant. These uh, Brussels sprouts were were sown in a really small tray. This was in high school when I was teaching high school. And we were trying to transplant way too many things in a week and they were transplanted way too small. Sometimes whenever we see issues, and like I mentioned this earlier, if it's purple, it could be a phosphorus deficiency or it could be too cold if it's next to a really cold window that's not getting any light. And also, if it's yellow, it could need a little bit of nitrogen, but ideally we, we want to under fertilize these seedlings because too much, a little bit of fertilizer goes a long way with these seedlings. So looking at these seedlings again, most of these have not developed true leaves yet. This is not a transplantable size. So those two big round leaves that we see on most of these, now these look like geraniums. They're actually coming up in the center with true leaves. Right now they are not a transplantable size. We still got a couple of weeks on those to go. Now looking at the timing on the soil germination, sometimes it can take a couple of weeks. Now this is when your soil temperature is anywhere from 50 to 65 degrees. So cabbage, broccoli, lettuce, anywhere from a week to a week and a half. Tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, which are the warm season type things, prefer the, the, the soil to be a little bit warmer, but they can take a couple of weeks to begin showing any signs of germination. And germination is just where the act of the seed starts growing. And then squash anywhere from four to 10 days. So just kind of have patience. Now all gardeners have patience because we always plant seeds with the hope that we're gonna get something later in the year. I can't harp on this enough. When we're transplanting these seedlings into another container, so we're starting them in a smaller container and then we're gonna transplant them into a, a container where they can get a little bit bigger we're gonna transplant them only when they develop true leaves and those two cotyledons have fallen off. Now it could be one cotyledon if it's like an onion or something, but for the most part, we want true leaves to come up and it could be three to four weeks just depending on the plant. And if you've got lights inside that you're using, you may not be providing it with enough light. 14 to 16 hours of light will help prevent stretching on these seedlings. And watch the roots. If you're transplanting some of these things, if we pull them apart really hard like, and we've got a bunch of tomatoes in a small container and we break off a lot of the roots, sometimes they won't be able to develop roots fast enough to keep the top alive. And then you can gradually start fertilizing once you've transplanted them into another container. 
when their seedling is just a few weeks old, it's probably not a good idea to use any type of fertilizer. Transplanting to a usable plant, now this is just general guidelines. It's gonna depend on how warm it is, how wet it is, uh, how much light it's getting. So there's a lot of factors that go into this, but you can ideally get some of these things to a transplantable size anywhere from five to seven weeks. So you can start your tomatoes this week, and if you do everything right, they're warm, they've got enough light, they've got a good soilless media, you're not keeping it too wet or too dry. You can have tomatoes and pepper, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants to transplant in the garden by the end of April. And I, I think that's a great time to do that because who knows when the last frost is going to be this year. Now, I know the weatherman this year, uh, week said some some questions about we're going to be in the 40s a couple of nights in the next 10 days. So just watch out for some of those things. And when we're getting transplants from the store, and this was at a little greenhouse, we want a healthy transplant. If we're buying transplants, look at the roots. Look at the leaves, look under the leaves, look for bugs. Be, be very uh, meticulous about looking at these things because if they've got diseases, you don't want to bring those diseases to your house. Hardening off, when we get these seedlings to a halfway decent size and they've been inside, they haven't really been exposed to the UV rays of the sun yet, and if we take them and throw them outside in full sun, what's going to happen? They're going to sunburn. So we need to kind of move them outside, let them get used to the wind, let them get used to a little rain, let them get used to the temperature fluctuations, let them get used to a little sun. Try and put them outside a few times on some overcast days. But if we just throw them outside, we've seen plants sunburn, and I've had people email me pictures. They say, what is wrong with my tomatoes or peppers? And all the leaves have this brown hue to them. And that's typically they weren't hardened off right, and they just got sunburned. Typically, they'll come out of it depending on the severity of it. Now, we do hardening off to thicken the cell walls, which is a cuticle layer, which is a waxy layer on top of the leaf, just to kind of make that a little bit harder. Now, I finished up those questions. I wanted to mention that website one more time, uthort.com. And if you are not from Wilson County, I'm Lucas Holman. I'm the horticulture extension agent in Wilson County. And if you're trying to figure out who your extension agent is, you go to utextension.tennessee.edu and you can go on there and click uh, contact your local office and you can go through and find them. It's best to email them right now through this interesting time that we've got. Now I'm going to hit stop recording.